Oh man, it's official. BlackRock, the $9 trillion asset manager, has officially filed for a Bitcoin spot ETF. But why is it that I'm feeling a little bit suspicious about it? Why is it that we should question this a little bit? We're going to get into why this could be a huge trap, whether we should get behind this ETF or whether we should be a little bit concerned. We're going to break it down. But first and foremost, this is the biggest asset manager in the world, BlackRock. You do not get any bigger than this filing for a spot ETF. Now, of course, we know that the SEC have rejected many ETFs from other people in the past. Will they now reject the most credible player in the US, a traditional finance company in BlackRock, and reject their spot ETF? Now, they went ahead and filed their S1. And one of the main contentions people are having around this in early days is to do with the forking. Right Under their key risks, they mention that if there is a fork, we have the right to do what we want. Right, We get to pick what we want to do in the case of a fork. Now, I think people are reading into this bit a bit too much. I want to show you the bits that we should be worried about, but I think you're reading too much into this bit. In their S1, you have to list all the key risks. Whether you're filing public for a stock or as ETF, you've got to list all, list all the key risks. You've got to be negative, uh, Nancy, and write down all the bad things that can happen. You've got to say that Bitcoin price can retrace in a bear market. You have to write that there could be a hash war. You have to write that there could be a fork of the chain. You have to do that. You have to show that you've gone through all the negative situations and told the shareholders what to expect. So I'm not too concerned about that. The other reason it's a bit of a fallacy is as an ETF hold, as an ETF owner, you want the ETF to be for the asset class that people want to buy. You don't have a good ETF. You don't have a business model if people are not buying your ETF. So if this was a spot ETF for Bitcoin Cash, then they should just create a Bitcoin Cash spot ETF now, if that's what they care about, or Bitcoin SV, right? Go do that now. But they know that they always want to be providing the Bitcoin spot ETF for whichever one is considered the true Bitcoin. So it, it, it doesn't really change anything in terms of our dynamics, right? Right now, Bitcoin is Bitcoin, and it always has been Bitcoin. And all the other ones are known as the forks in different directions they've gone in. Now, if, that, if there's another fork in the future, whichever one is considered still the original Bitcoin, the ultimate Bitcoin, where the majority of people go towards, that is the one that ultimately they're going to list, because that's where their profit's going to lie. So I wouldn't worry too much about those little points when you read the S1. And of course, you should read the S1. It's very useful to read the S1. There's a lot of different things that they've listed in there. Now, what majorly got me worried is this. I want to go back to Larry Fink, who obviously owns BlackRock. He's the, he's the main man, the CEO uh, at BlackRock. And in 2017, he labeled Bitcoin as the index of money laundering. In 2022, he started U-turning and changing his stance on crypto. By 2023, he was a full-on bull. And that's okay, right? That's one thing I'll say is, okay, fine, I'll, I'll accept it. People can change their mind on Bitcoin. We've seen the same with Jamie Dimon over, um, over at JP Morgan. This happens. But then I, it, it got me thinking, right? If you think about the US, <clears throat> and we've said this about the SEC, why are the SEC going after crypto so bad? It's not that they want to push away innovation. It's that US markets want to have innovation which they can control. We want innovation. Do, create Silicon Valley, create Instagram, create Facebook, create WhatsApp. We want control of it, right? We don't care about innovation, right? Like look at TikTok offices in the UK, in US, right? Well, they want to kick them out because they can't control it. If we don't have control over it, we don't want that innovation. And it's the same for traditional finance. So it gets you thinking, when traditional finance cannot control the web free narrative, when it was the early days and they saw it as a threat because it had nothing to do with them, they didn't like it. They were saying negative things. Jamie Dimon, Larry Fink at BlackRock. They were saying negative things about it. Of course they were. It's a competitor, right? It was created as an antithesis to, to, to uh, traditional finance. And so we ended up going a full circle now, where now you're getting the same individual starting to talk positively about crypto. And that gets my radar tingling. I'm like, that doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. We created a product to be the antithesis to you guys. And I used to work in TradFi. So I know all the failings of TradFi. We've been through it. You guys know it. it's widely publicized. Everybody knows. And we create this antithesis. And we're still early in our journey. We're still embryonic. We've still got a lot of work to do, granted. But we, we want to be different. We don't want to commingle with those guys, right? And so it gets me thinking, are they only now showing interest because they figured a way of how to control it? And that's where it gets interesting. And that then made me, reminded me of this, where I dug up um, the story of Soros, right? George Soros, one of the biggest billionaires in the States, biggest fund managers. And you can find out that the CEO of Soros fund manager, Dawn Fitzpatrick, said last week, crypto is here to stay. But the recent tumult provides an opportunity 
for traditional finance to take the lead. Platforms like Binance and Coinbase would have benefited from having an adult in the room, she said. And you can keep going and she says crypto is here to stay. What's happened is clearly a setback. But right now, I actually think it's a huge opportunity for the incumbent financial firms to take the lead. This is unbelievable, right? This is unbelievable. So you've got traditional finance sat there saying we never liked crypto. And then they're you turning now because they've gone, hang on a second. Binance and Coinbase are messing up. They're getting slapped up by the regulators. We're going to step in here. Because we know how to play the regulator games. We're sat here comfortably in bed with the regulators. We have been for many decades. We know exactly what we're doing, right? This is how we operate. So we'll just say to the regulators, we'll take care of crypto. Just give that to us. If you're in safe hands here, even though we know traditional finance is useless, how many banking collapses have we had to start of 2023? More than any crypto collapses, yet no regulation. Don't care about customers funds there, no? Just, just going to bail it out. Why can't you bail out crypto as well then? Right? No, it's not about that. You want to protect, you want to safeguard our funds in crypto and, and close down Binance.us and, and Coinbase, right? Of course. And so this makes you think that like, this, is, this is a very, very slippery path to go down, right? Where you allow crypto to get in such a position where it's so weak and we're so desperate to have this spot ETF that we allow an incumbent to control the situation. Now, had this have been a situation where it, you know, Crypto wasn't being targeted by the SEC. It was being accepted with open arms. You had Binance, you had Coinbase, everything was running as per normal. And then you just happened to have a BlackRock or somebody issue the ETF. I'd be less concerned. But given the dynamics we're seeing right now, where you've got Operation Choke Point, you've got all the native crypto companies, you know, the companies which were there when nobody cared about crypto, the Coinbase, the Binance, building from the bottom, getting kind of shunned to the side. And these new and these old guard incumbent financial players, trad five players are coming in to step in and try to control our crypto landscape. It gets me very worried. I'm not gonna lie, it gets me very worried. Now one thing which just kind of really confused me here with this data was how they opted to have let's just jump into the S1, I'm gonna show you actually. They opted to have Coinbase, yep, Coinbase as the main custodian. Right? So if you look here on this section here, they've had they chose to have Coinbase as the custodian. So BlackRock is going to be the trustee, Coinbase is going to be the custodian, and the cash custodian is going to be BNY Mellon. Right? Very, very interesting. So this makes me again really confused. So you're going to list a Bitcoin ETF. You're going to say you're going to keep any cash associated with the with the trust along with BNY Mellon. Fine. Any Bitcoin that's held, because obviously when people buy the ETF, you give them a share and you hold the actual Bitcoin. They're saying they're going to custody, the, custody that with Coinbase. But is this the same Coinbase that last week was deemed to be running an unregistered security broker clearinghouse? Right? Really confusing. Really confusing. And, and now it gets you to a situation where if, I, if this kind of gets accepted, if this ETF goes through when so many else has been rejected... I'm just always going to be a little bit confused by it. I'm going to be a little bit suspicious by it because they rejected so many and now suddenly they step in, uh, they being BlackRock, and suddenly it's accepted. So either way, we have seen that this news has come through. Bitcoin did rally on the news, as you could expect, right? It came at a time where Bitcoin was really reeling. It was reeling on the back of bad news. We're struggling with all the SEC litigation. Uh, obviously, the FOMC kind of rug pulled us the night before. Then you had Tether Depeg yesterday morning, waking up to Tether Depegging. And it was a nasty day yesterday, right? We really did wick down below 25,000 and it wasn't looking good. But then you did have a nice recovery candle. And we ended up finishing the day yesterday close to 1.8% in the green as Tether started to repeg. But also we got news of this ETF. Now, today we're opening up fairly flat. Flat. But the question is going to be, how long can this move last, right? Like, how, how precarious of a situation are we in? Well, on the daily chart, you know we're in this falling wedge. And two days ago, we broke down from the falling wedge. Yesterday, it looked like we were really going to consolidate below this falling wedge. And then we managed to finish the day green. So now we're hanging on here in the bottom. But it still doesn't look too great, right? We've got to keep our uh, wits about us. Because the next support when breaking to the downside is around 24.3 here on this little cluster we've got here as we fall. But then thereafter, you really do start collapsing to the 19.5 to 20k region, roughly where my cursor is here. That's where the move originally started to take us into the wedge. So that's what we're looking at to the downside. Now, the risk you then have, if I notch up to the weekly chart, is once you start to do that, we're really, really close to losing our eBay ribbon, right? Yesterday, when we were having that horrible 
single day and we wick down, look at that wick. We were well below our EMA ribbon here. If we close at those levels which we touched upon, right? If we get back to those lows of 24,700 where we touched and close there, we've lost our EMA ribbon. And that's going to spell a big pain. If we can hold above our EMA ribbon, like where we're at now, if we can finish off the week strong with three days remaining, we close this candle on a Sunday, great stuff. That's great news, right? And if the ETF can give help that news, that's good because we're an important moment right now. And if this ETF gives us the hopium we need to kind of clear past this level, great stuff. But for me, that ETF leaves a little bit more to be designed. And just, just the timing of it, the tradfi nature of it has me a little bit worried. And the question is going to be, will it be passed? Or will the SEC just shut it down, particularly if Coinbase are involved as well? So got to watch out for that. Good news that USDT is starting to repeg. I will cover that off so you guys can see that as well. You are sitting at 0.999 on the third decimal place. So that looks pretty stable here now. Far more, far less to be uh, worried about. And a bunch of you guys were kind of like being really odd yesterday and saying, oh, this is clickbait. How is it clickbait when I put the title as USDT depegged? Are you feeling okay? Like, do you guys want the data or do you not want the data? Let's keep it straight, right? If you want the data, I'm going to tell you what the data is. But that's what happened. Right? Don't listen to these people that just say it's fun. No, we have to be real with what data we're facing. We've got to react to our data. And it depegged yesterday, and it shouldn't depeg. It's a stable coin. Now, at the, throughout the time, I said, I think they're going to recover. It should be fine. But we've got to be aware of it. We can't just bury our head in the sand and say everything's fun. No, when there's negative data, let's address it. Right? The SEC suing Coinbase and, and uh, Binance is bad data. It's bad stuff. It's facts. It's not FUD. It's real stuff. The USDT debugging yesterday is FUD. No, it's not. It's not FUD, is it? Right? It's happened. Now we, we get through it, fine, but it should never have depegged in the first place. So there you have it, guys. Hope you enjoyed this video. As always, don't forget to smash up the likes. Don't forget to subscribe. Check out this video here, and I'll see you in the next one.